Well, people wonder, you know, parents, teachers wonder why our children so different in their ability to learn, like to learn to read or just to learn more generally. But if you think about children in one classroom, the teacher knows these children differ a lot. Why do they differ? They can't differ because they're in different classrooms or teachers. They they're in the same school, so it can't be school. So what makes them so different? And the obvious answer seems to be, well, the family. But when people say the family, they think of what we call nurture. You know, the parents are providing opportunities for the children that maybe other children don't get. But what's exciting about our research is that it's showing that the biggest factor in why children differ in their ability to learn or perform at school is genetics, by which I mean inherited DNA differences between children that they've inherited from their parents. When I talk about inherited differences, there's a lot of misconceptions. And what I mean is what people mean when they talk about inherited eye color, hair color, height. It means inherited DNA differences between people account for the differences that we observe. But it's talking about differences between people. It's not talking about one individual. So I'm six foot five inches tall, which is 77 inches. Height is 90% heritable. That means of the obvious differences you see between people in height, 90% of the differences are due to genetic, inherited DNA differences between people. But that doesn't mean that my 70 inches were because of genes and then seven inches because of the environment. It's a really important point. We're not talking about one individual, but about differences between people in a particular population at a particular time. Um, so if, if you accept this message that DNA differences are very important, accounting for over half of the differences between children's performance on, say, national curriculum tests. Our most recent studies were on GCSE and we're currently working on A-level scores. But for all those levels, from early school till A-levels, about 60% of the differences between children are due to genetic differences, DNA differences. And that you might say, well, then it's all over. Well, it isn't because that's not 100%, first of all. But secondly, there's some really interesting aspects if you explore this a bit further. Clever parents will, on average, have clever children. But what people don't realize, it's not 100% heritable. So that means, on average, the children are going to be less, they do less well at school than their parents. And a really interesting implication of this is that in every generation, most of the brightest, best children will not come from the best educated, the best test-taking parents. They'll come from the middle of the distribution, from average, parents of average ability or performance. And the reason for that is that everything, like school achievement scores, is distributed what we call in a normal distribution. That's that familiar bell-shaped curve. You take height, anything that you measure quantitatively, serum, cholesterol level, anything, it's distributed normally. That means most people are in the middle, and as you go further and further out at the extremes, there are fewer and fewer people. So if you take the, the parents who did very well, there's very few of them. And their children actually perform less well than the parents, on average, we're talking about. So what that means, though, is that most, the vast majority of the, of the population's in the middle, and because genetics involves mixing up genes, most of the children in the next generation who will be the best at school will not be from the cleverest parents. They'll be from parents of average ability. And to make this work, we need social mobility. That's the really interesting aspect of this. It kind of turns our thinking on social mobility upside down. Most people think of social mobility as um, getting rid of parental privilege, you know, wealth and educational opportunities that we think of as environmental. But what if you accept what I'm saying about genetics? What does this mean then? Does it mean there's a genetic caste system that all, you know, that if your parents are bright, you're going to be bright? It doesn't really mean that for the reasons I've just described. What's interesting is that if there is social mobility, the children from the middle who actually have great talent and ability will be allowed to perform at the level they ought to perform. And it means a lot of children of parents of privilege will go back to the population mean if there's social mobility, both up 
and down. There is no genetic caste system. To the contrary, genetics could be an index of social mobility. Because if there is educational opportunity for all children, that means that the the differences that are left are going to be primarily genetic differences so that the extent of genetic influence, we call it heritability, could be an index of social mobility, which turns the whole thing of social mobility on its head. Well, I think um, it, people often ask, well, so what good is this to me as a teacher? And um, I think it's first important to say there are no necessary policy implications for really anything in science because science gives you a, a knowledge base but policy is based on values as well. So that's the first point, no necessary policy implications. But I think there are some very important implications first at a general level. And one of those is to just simply recognize that children are not blobs of clay that we mold to be whatever we want them to be. Children differ and they differ genetically. It doesn't mean you can't do anything about the differences, but it means that some children are going to find it much more difficult, say, to learn to read. And it's not because they have bad schools, bad teachers, bad parents, or that they're bad themselves, unmotivated. It's just going to be a lot harder for them to learn to read. So recognizing that children are different genetically is an important principle for education. And it's not one that gets recognized in teacher training material, for example. So I think it is an important general principle. And sometimes general principles have more far-reaching effects than a very specific policy implication. So I think recognizing the differences and respecting them is also important in the sense that you don't just automatically blame teachers and schools and parents. Realize that genetics is important. So I think that's one important principle is recognizing and respecting individual differences. And another thing that follows from this, I think, um, is more of a policy thing, but it's one that I, I think the educational system is moving towards, and that's sort of individualized or personal learning. If you recognize and respect differences among children, you realize not only do they differ in how easily they learn, but it's sort of in what they learn and what they like to learn. It's appetites as much as aptitudes. So I think what genetics suggests is that we ought to be providing the opportunities for children to discover their strengths and minimize their weaknesses and people say, yeah, that all sounds good, sure, sure, how are we going to do that? Well, I think with technology, computers alone, but all the other sorts of technology that are available, we ought to be able to individualize instruction to a much greater extent. It's happening a lot with math, for example, which is the easiest one to do. And does that mean then we don't need teachers anymore? Absolutely not. But I would think teachers should be happy to think that they'll be freed up from standing in front of a classroom giving a one-size-fits-all education that doesn't fit anybody, boring the brightest kids, above the heads of the kids who have most trouble learning. You'd think that teachers would welcome this because it would give them an opportunity to really personalize learning, finding out what this particular child is having trouble with and helping them over those hurdles. In summary, I guess what I'd like to be able to tell teachers is that um, don't be afraid of genetics and let's be able to discuss genetics because um, what, what's happening, I don't, didn't want to get into this particularly, but uh, something called DNA chips. People are beginning to find some of the genes responsible for genetic influence. And we're not talking about one or two or three genes. We're talking about thousands of genes that contribute to differences between children and their ability to learn or their behavior problems, that sort of thing. And when that happens, and it will be happening in the next decade, I'm sure, um, we should be prepared, we should have had these kind of mature discussions about what does genetics mean and what does it not mean before we get into DNA chips, which will be able to predict genetic differences at the level of DNA. So um, basically, I'd be happy if we can just put genetics and education together in the same sentence without people getting all upset.